Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Hello, and welcome to Professor Game. Today, we have an awesome guest, and it's Eric, Eric Van Mechelen. Eric, are you prepared to engage? Let's do it, Rob. Let's do it. So Eric is the director of member success of the Octalysis Group. He's there to ensure that Octalysis Prime members succeed in the gamification and human-focused design education experience. He's also the editor-in-chief for ukaichao.com and lead writer for the Octalysis Group blog. He holds quite a few positions as a writer, and I must add that I met him through Octalysis Prime, where he regularly emails the members and participates in live activities that are very exciting, I must add, as well. So, Eric, let's get right into the interview. The first question that, that we always make our guests is, we want to know a bit more, how does a regular day with Eric look like? What do you do? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Rob. <laughs> a typical day um, is kind of preparing, uh, getting up with my, my girlfriend and preparing you know, breakfast and coffee and a smoothie and getting her out the door. It's always a fun time for us to you know, communicate about our day. Um, and I feel that that time strengthens our relationship. And awesome. I actually make a, a, a quick stop at the, the gym in our building on the way back up from the parking garage, uh, which is a little gamification uh, technique that I've employed. Um, and then, you know, when you say quick work, stop, how, how long do you spend in that gym? I mean, it could sometimes only be five minutes. Um, it could be 15 minutes. And the point is just to get, um, my body moving, getting some energy flow. Um, I do other workouts on my regular schedule. Hmm. So that's just a quick, a quick piece. Um, if I'm feeling really good, I might even walk back up the five flights of stairs, right? Okay. So that's getting my, my body moving. Um, yeah, and then I'm getting into to, to my work day, which is uh, about half uh, of work with the Octalysis group and then half my own writing. Hmm. Sounds very exciting. So you're a full-fledged writer, as I see. Yeah, so this journey has uh, been about three the past three years uh, i would say i'm a a full-time writer editor book reviewer and uh for the past year and a half now i've i've um, worked i've known and worked with with yukai at uh, the octalysis group and so um my work ranges from doing blog posts for both his business as well as his consumer side uh, I do a lot of his email marketing and email newsletters, uh, some of the, the live community engagement, which you uh, briefed us on in the opening. Um, and then on my, uh, on my personal side, I do um, quite a bit of essay writing about philosophy, literature, culture, um, many other topics, science. Um, and I also enjoy science fiction and fantasy writing uh, on the fiction side. May I ask, Eric, what did you major in? Well, I majored in economics, hmm. um, but I also studied, I went to a liberal arts college here in the United States, which allowed students to take courses across many disciplines. So I studied in the political science department. I studied in the English and creative writing department. I also studied Chinese and international relations. So my interests uh, were fortunately, my diverse interests were able to be uh, satisfied in the four years there while still getting an economics degree. <laughs> Sounds amazing. On a side note, mm -hmm. I did study Chinese as well for like a year and I can remember like how to say thank you and maybe two or three more things. <laughs> <laughs> it was super hard and to be honest, it was a very tough year for me and at the university, but it was amazing. I, to be honest, it's, it's something I want to get back to someday. Um, I didn't complete my French <laughs> education, so that's something still on the list as well. But Chinese was, man, it was hard. It was a hard thing. I, I didn't like, I mean, I, I enjoyed the language very much, but I think the methodology was something that put me off a bit because they tried to put us both in the, the writing, 
the reading and the speaking. So I guess it's, I mean, for Chinese, mm. it's a bit too much. I mean, in my experience, at least. I, I, I would share that. I felt that the speaking, although my pronunciation was not great, the speaking by itself was not overly challenging. But once you added the writing and reading with the traditional yeah. Chinese characters, then it's a, it's a whole different animal. Like just learning how to, how to read is massive and learning how to write is also massive. It's like learning it. I don't know if you don't lear- know how to speak German, learning German, I would, I would say this is just writing is harder than German for sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's cool. Awesome. I didn't know we had that in common. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the next question I have, uh, Eric, that our audience is always interested in is for you to tell us a story of the worst application of game thinking, gamification that you've participated in or seen from like very, very up close. You don't, of course, uh, there's many NDAs in our industry, so you don't have to name any names. Maybe just name it the, the general things, but especially we, we're interested in how all these things got to happen. And of course, what did you learn from it? Sure. So I don't know if this qualifies as, as the worst, but I hope, I hope it's useful for, for your listeners. Uh, so lately, I mentioned the essay writing that I, I'm doing. Um, lately, I've been writing on Medium.com, which I think is a great platform for writers and bloggers. And I actually was able to uh, achieve through uh, engagement with my my essays, um, in particular, one essay about kind of the psychology of forecasting, uh, making predictions and decisions in one in one's own life. Through that article, was actually able to achieve um, the top writer status within the psychology area of Medium, Woot. and and that was yes. Yeah, so this was very exciting uh, accomplishment for me. You know, very unexpected being just a solo writer writing about these topics purely out of out of interest. Um, the essay itself was in a book review format, so I wrote probably an eight minute article or so, and I yeah eventually was featured by the Medium editing staff and then I was able to get more readership there and then eventually the top writer status comes with that through um, the various mechanisms they have you know total number of readers total um, reading time views things like this Um, but one thing that I noticed is that I was very attached to the stats page that medium provides all of its uh, writers so the stats page in itself is not a bad application of, of game thinking because it does provide in addition to total number of views on your articles by article it also includes total number of reads so you can see how many people out of say in this most recent article i just mentioned out of the a thousand people that viewed it about 550 people so over 50 percent read nearly the entire article so this is very, a, very this good. is this is great feedback for me as a writer in terms of oh okay a thousand people and it's an eight minute article this is not a short article about a pretty niche topic so this is fantastic however <laughs> this stats page is also very addictive in the sense that I found myself checking this stats page multiple times per day almost in this in the same sense that someone who perhaps when they send a job application to an employer they're they're waiting for this this to come back right because they they want that feedback and so this is an example and i haven't figured out what the solution to this could be but i found that when i was checking the stats page i was not doing something productive next the emotion the emotional reaction that i was getting was sort of a negative reaction in the event that you know my stats weren't improving or even if my stats were improving, I felt good for a moment, and then what happened? I was distracted from my other work, and then I had the negative feedback of, mm-hmm. "Oh, I was distracted." So, 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 have you? Mm-hmm. Sorry to, to jump in. Have you? Sure. Have you read or have you been in contact with the material of Nir Eyal? He talks a lot about this. Uh, Nir Eyal, yes. Um, interesting backstory. And I want to hear your point, but interesting twenty-second backstory. Yeah. How I started working with Yukai was I read Niriel's Hooked, hmm. and then I read Yukai's book, and I wrote a 20-page short essay comparing those two books, and that's ah, cool. actually one of the reasons that that Yukai wanted to work with me after that. That's so cool. My point was, I mean, he, it's, there's something that he ta- this is something that he talks about very much, and when you were saying it, I, and I know sometimes the things are like standing right in front of us, and and maybe we don't. 
we don't see them, but maybe the obvious solution would be not to update it like immediately. If you know that it's going to be updated maybe once a day, you know you're not going to check it more than once a day. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. maybe it's just as simple as that. I mean, of course, if you can have live stats, it can be useful for many things. But I mean, if it's just for checking, maybe what you want to do is make sure that you check it once a day. I mean, for, for medium, it could be a general solution, but for, for, for your cases saying, well, I'm going to check it once a day, set a schedule, and I'm going to check it at this time, see what happens and have some action points. Um, there's something I found very useful in, in, in reading in getting back to my reading practice. Um, I, mm-hmm. I quit reading like more than I would have ever wished. And what has gotten me like very, very into it is I am committed to taking notes of what I read. And I've also mm-hmm. started implementing this with, with podcasts. So I, it gets me almost forced to actually pay attention uh, to the podcast if it's a podcast or actually read and, and like seriously read. So I take notes of that. You could do something similar and maybe, and I quote here, I'm doing air quotes, um, force mm-hmm. yourself into like, okay, I'm going to watch the stats, but I need to do something with the stats next. So maybe every time when, when you reach a point where there's nothing more you can do, you say, well, since I can't do anything more, I can't watch the stats, you know, that kind of forcing yourself into into making your own game and saying well this is it or if i do it and i don't do something i have to make 10 push-ups so of course at some point you can't make any more push-ups and you you decide <laughs> i mean i'm done i mean i can't keep on watching this so those those could be some some interesting thoughts so sorry to, to, I really, to jump in i really like that <laughs> i really i really like that i think that would work and i think that's something that medium could you know from a software standpoint they could easily implement this but if not, I can do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's, there's, there's also the, the ethics part, you know, that when, and, and Nier mentions, mentioned this at some point as well. He says, well, I'm doing stuff to get people engaged and, and, and get them very engaged. But of course, do you want to engage? How much do you want people to get engaged with your product? I mean, if you want people like addiction, like a casino, I mean, how, how, do, how do you, are, are casinos ethically supposed to actually help? Uh, the mm-hmm. people who are addicted to that and uh, the, if they have like a, there's like a way i'm not sure the legals but if you say i have to not come back to this casino and i want to not ever come back don't let me in they are supposed mm-hmm. to not let you in but of course this kind of works because they're interested in getting you back because if you're addicted to casinos you're probably one of their best spenders so you know there's sure. there's a there's a tough one there for for them and then when they come back they just have a lot of pent up energy in it yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, to, to use. That's interesting because just one more point on the medium. Yep. There were, there were moments where I would come back, I'd see the stats hadn't changed so much. So then I think, well, what if I, what if I share this again on, on social, uh, or what if I find a different way to, what if I find someone who I think would be interested in this and share it via email, hmm. you know? And so I was looking for ways, which is good for Medium because it's bringing more people to their platform to read. And o- overall, I think they're trying to do a, a good thing to, uh, you know, they're trying to be the best platform for thought. They have this this kind of grand vision. And um, from an ethics standpoint, I think it's slightly different in intent than- oh, For sure, for uh, sure. I mean, than, it's not an addict that they're yeah. not getting money from you checking it 50 times a day. Of course not, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so that but that also wasn't so from an individual standpoint, taking extra time to go on social this uh, or or just to spam, you know, my social <laughs> networks is not not such a good thing either. Yeah. So, Eric, I want you now to, to to switch back your 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 switch into success and, and tell us what's the biggest challenge that you faced and solved using game thinking, gamification, games, etc. So throughout the last three years, I've also concurrently been working on a science fiction and fantasy novel. So the the goal is to approach agents or you know big big publishers in 2018. So it's been quite a long-term journey and the problems that I faced were twofold. One, completing the novel hmm. and two, revising for the quality that it needs to be in order to get the attention of agents and publishers. I was able to finish the novel quite quickly, the first draft. However, for your listeners who aren't familiar with novel writing, especially for someone like me who, who would be a debut author, the time to get to that level of quality, it, it's quite a significant startup cost. In my case, I've already been working on this particular uh, novel three years. Wow. Um, and I 
would say I've been working at least 20% of kind of my working day on that throughout that time. So significant amount of my time. Very large investments, uh, yeah. Across that three years. Yeah, for, you know, in financial terms, for no uh, for no payback at this point. So the, the key thing was finding the intrinsic motivation, identifying what intrinsically was interesting about this for me, um, but then also building a routine that allowed me to gain momentum across whatever draft or revision I was in at that moment. You know, the, um, this, that slight yeah. edge that compounds, the compound effect, there's, I think there are two books named that way. I mean, it's something mm -hmm. that helps you, of course, get your momentum and, and reach very far. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a quick, a quick example, just so that it's really, uh, it's easy to touch and, and feel. Once I completed a, a certain revision, this was about a year and a half ago, I decided I wanted to show, I felt I had taken the book as far as I could go at that, at that moment. I wanted to share this with not just one or two people, but a group of, of beta readers but maybe we can call them alpha readers, like early readers who were very engaged in the science fiction or fantasy community. So they'd understand that genre and can give me very constructive feedback. And so I actually used um, Heroku and Slack and built my own Slack community. And I was able within two or three weeks to get 50 people into that community to be, you know, my early readers. That's impressive, man. And so it, it actually solved my initial need, which was to get feedback on the novel. Like many of those 50 people read significant portions of the novel and the novel's, you know, 300 pages long. So that was cool. But then it actually grew beyond that into an accountability system for me, because once I had the feedback, my promise was that I would be making updates and edits and revisions based on that feedback. And I had all of these people waiting in my Slack community for my weekly updates. Right. So I was able to to build on my initial aim of just getting people to read it. But once I built a relationship with them, then suddenly I I felt this this affinity towards them and and this desire to also please them and show them that they had used their feedback and their help you, you, to even make the book better. You put yourself in a place where you were again quote, air quotes forced into into doing what you actually wanted to do. Right, right. Um, you know, on the days where my motivation was less, because we have all have those days, it's just natural fluctuation. Those days that kind of external motivation of wanting to connect with that group and, and, and show that group that I was doing good because of the you know good they provided me was very helpful. Great. So now we have two stories. The first one, I would say the learnings are vast. There's many things I would like to highlight, of course, the way you learn you to realize that you were getting addicted and then thinking, trying to think outside the box to see how you could either think of a solution and have use your creativity to think of a solution for medium or think for something for yourself. So actually looking for the solution to the problem yourself. And here, of course, building accountability for yourself, definitely putting yourself surrounded by the right people and and using that social pressure from gamification as well to get your goals actually accomplished. So I would like to highlight those two. Is there anything you would like to highlight from these two stories, Eric? I think you covered it very well. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's go to the last one. And here I'm going to challenge you to make a quicker answer. And it's about what process do you follow when you are going to apply gamification to something? I think the easiest way to describe what I do is is think about the the why. So it, it's a simple question: of Why am I, you know, why am I doing this? Like, why am I actually interested in this? And thinking about the intrinsic against the extrinsic motivation. I think sometimes intrinsic and extrinsic motivation blend. But if I can find an intrinsic, if there is an intrinsic reason for me to do whatever it is that I'm doing, then that's usually a really good place to start. By the same token, if there's something that's in pro uh, in progress that I'm doing. Let's say it's an essay series or a blog post, and I look I look again at it because something doesn't feel right. I can I can look at that intrinsic and extrinsic and find a way to latch onto one of those to kind of course correct what I'm doing. Either make something more interesting, add some curiosity, or maybe it's just something I should drop altogether because I wasn't in it for the right reasons to begin with. Sounds great. Thank you very much for those answers, Eric. So let's move on now to the second part of the interview. These are rather than the stories that we were having before. Here I'd like you to go more for the quick answers, to give us some quick tips, tactics, and tools. So what's one best practice that you could name for gamification or game thinking? My favorite thing to do is to think about how to add more creativity and problem solving components to whatever I'm doing, because that's 
where I think I can add the most value based upon what my personality is and my talents and my strengths. So I look for the place within whatever I'm doing that will allow me to be most creatively free. Awesome. So I would I would brief that and and expand it more generally to saying think about who you're designing for. If it's for yourself, think of yourself. If you're designing for your students, think about who your students might be and what motivates them most and try to blend in those elements into whatever you're you're creating. Does that make sense? Beautiful. <laughs> Eric, what's your favorite game? My favorite game right now is is actually trying to get my novel published. I think I think that's my favorite game right now. <laughs> that's awesome. Next question would be Eric, who would you like to have interviewed in Professor Game? So this seems like recency bias, but I'm very curious um, if you can get uh, near y'all on the show. <laughs> Just because, yeah, I think he thinks clearly about these things, and I like the ethical component. But you know what? I'm also, uh, I also think you should look to get someone like a uh, Cal Newport. He's a computer science um, professor and writer, and and he has some kind of contrarian uh, thoughts on technology and how it can be used as well. So in a similar line of, of ethics, but also from a productivity standpoint, he could be a great person. Awesome. Sounds great. The next question is, I would like to know what you consider is your superpower. My superpower is is the ability to look for a counter argument to almost any argument, <laughs> even if even if uh, that isn't my position. The reason I think this is a superpower and that I encourage everyone that I meet if I get into this place in the conversation is because this allows one to practice um, empathy, but also building of reasoning. And this to me is crucial, whether you're in sales, whether you're designing something for someone, whether you're uh, trying to solve, you know, a cross-cultural conflict, geopolitics, it's covering so many different areas or uh, in terms of its application. Yeah, it sounds like a very useful, useful ability to think outside the box and especially to try to think outside of your own head and think of what right. other people might say. Exactly. The other thing we would like to know, Eric, is some piece of advice that you would like to give people who have never engaged their learners to, to use game thinking. The, the place that I usually go to is my experiences that I've had. So the easy places to go, when you ask me what my favorite game is, I probably gave you a contrarian answer there slightly. I was adjusting the kind of definition of game. But growing up, I played a lot of tabletop games. My favorite tabletop game was Diplomacy. This was a game of kind of social influence in a geopolitical setting. I played a lot of real-time strategy games like StarCraft. Um, I, I still play chess um, almost daily on chess.com. Um, I think you need to look, if you're new to gamification, you need to look at games that you've played and not only think about how you would form strategies within those games, but think about how you how you would approach the game if some of the rules were changed. For example, I am a, uh, I played soccer in university and the offsides rule is a very important part of the game of soccer. But what if offsides was removed from the rule set? How would would I play the game or how would I coach a team to play the game if that rule was removed? Um, and this is an exercise in just using the experiences that you had in games to think about building strategies because this, when we come back to design, allows us to think of... Um, Alternative paths, no? Yeah, yeah. That, I, think that's, I think that's pretty much what it is. That's awesome. Eric, now I'm going to ask you a question that comes from the audience. Uh, it's kind of random, but not completely, because I, I had to, to curate the, the, the questions first so that they make sense for, for the show. And the answer, the, the question that we have today is, how do you think that games or gamification can facilitate learning? So I think the most powerful way that I've seen is in creating pathways or sort of guided tours of a given subject matter approach or even a, a meta learning approach like to understand how one learns for themselves. So let me give an example. Um, there's a company out there called Degreed.com, which I did some consulting with a few years back now. And and they're just trying to provide companies with a way to say you are a manager, give your team various learning, whether it is through an LMS or across you know the many libraries of video content online, and encourage the employees to learn on their own, right? Okay. But also as a manager, 
but as the manager, see that progress and be able to guide and, and advise and check in um, for accountability purposes. And so I think gamification can can give us the motivational design from the learner standpoint, engage with something that I want to learn in a meaningful time frame. Things move so quickly, right? So the ability to learn something in a reasonable time frame is important so that you can actually use that skill and be ahead of the curve. But then also from the company lens, uh, since it seems like lifelong learning is a real leg up for you if you've sort of taken on this idea that I need to continue learning throughout my life in order to have a successful uh, career, but also just to enjoy life, then that can be be applied to you as a learner from someone who understands that, even if the learners themselves don't quite yet understand that. That's some great advice. The last question before we ask you the, the final, how can we connect with you, is what book would you recommend to our listeners? So I actually had the chance to, to meet Jane McGonigal. Um, she's probably pretty well known to your listeners uh, in 2012. And I, I re- actually had read her book, Reality is Broken, just before I had a chance to go see her speak. And I think this is the great starter book for anyone who's interested in, in gamification and learning um, because it, it will just give you a reminder of the potential at the individual but also the global level of kind of game thinking, gameful thinking, gameful design. And that's a great place to start. And from there, I would jump into kind of whatever strikes your fancy after that, because she mentioned so many of the great thinkers and writers in in this area. And that will definitely be, uh, will definitely not be a waste of your time to start there. Awesome. Some great advice. And finally, Eric, how can we connect with you? And if you have any final words, and then we'll say game over. Beautiful. Well, thanks for the time. Uh, it's been really fun talking about this. My purpose lately in the way that I've been thinking is that that wisdom um, must be earned. And so I, I need not be in a rush to acquire wisdom um, because it, by definition, can't be acquired quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so that that might be my, my, my parting message. And that's something that I'm thinking about and writing about online now. So my my website is ericvanmecklen.com and I'm writing essays on medium.com. That sounds awesome, Eric. Uh, we'll put your, your Twitter handle and your link to your medium in the show notes. So if you want to check that out to make sure you wrote the last names correctly, it's van, like van, V-A-N, like a van and Mecklen, which is a bit more complicated, but you can get that in the show notes in professorgame.com. So that's it. Thank you very much, Eric, for participating in this interview. It was very a lot of fun and it was very interesting. So that's it. Thank you very much and game over. Thanks so much, Rob. Hey, engagers, happy holidays. Today is December 25. So thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. If you want more interviews with incredible guests like Eric Van Mecklen and lots of awesome stuff from Professor Game, then go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started in our email list. That way we can be in contact and you will be the first to know of any opportunities that Professor Game might have for you. Hey, before you go into your next mission and on to 2018, would you like to know what is our episode special for next week? Well, listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there!